Every piece of content is a piece in the bridge that connects you to your audience. It's about building that bridge with care and intention and a deep understanding of the needs and the aspirations of those that you serve. I think this is the essence of a strategic creation mindset that transforms content from just mere information into a powerful tool for connection and changing lives. I'm Amy Porterfield, ex-corporate girl turned CEO of a multi seven-figure business. But it wasn't all that long ago that I lacked the confidence, the budget, and the time to focus on growing my small but mighty business. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, and you'll see the business I have today, one that changes lives and gives me more freedom than I ever thought possible, one that used to only exist as a daydream. I created the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you do the same. If you're an ambitious entrepreneur or one in the making who's looking to create a business that makes an impact and a life you love, you're in the right place, friend. Let's get started. Hey there, Amy here. Welcome back to another episode of Online Marketing Made Easy. Today, we are talking about content creation. Because listen, if you have a business online, if you want to become the go to source for your audience, if you want to stay top of mind, and if you just want to give amazing value to those you serve, then my friend, you've got to be creating consistent content, you already know that. But also, sometimes it can be really frustrating. Like, How am I going to come up with all these new ideas for content? I feel like I've already done it all. And sometimes you just feel like you're on a constant content hamster wheel. I have absolutely been there. But I've also overcome this challenge with content creation. And so I thought I could share some tips with you today to make it easier for you as well. Now, the strategies I'm going to be sharing with you, they've been the backbone of how my team and I have created content for years. So these are battle tested strategies. Here's what I'm going to cover. Number one, the art of inspiration and unblocking creativity Two, organizational and management systems for peak efficiency, three, mastering content repurposing Four, integrating AI tools. That's been big for us. So I want to talk about that. And then five, cultivating a strategic content creation mindset. And just one last thought before we dive in. When I first started my business for many, many years, it was just me or me and a five hour a week virtual assistant. So the strategies I'm going to share with you that I've used really since the beginning, I was a one woman show and I was implementing them. So if you're flying solo or if you do have a team, either way, what I break down today will be actionable and help elevate your content game while reclaiming your time and freedom. Can I get an amen? That part is really important. So if you're ready to jump off the content creation hamster wheel and get some of your time back, well then buckle up because this episode is for you. So I run a content centric business where I produce a substantial amount of both free and paid content and falling into a rut where I'm not staying innovative or inspired or relevant is really not an option if I want to remain an industry expert and a trusted mentor for my students. Which brings me to the first strategy that my team and I use to elevate our content game, and that is the art of inspiration and unblocking creativity. And if you know me, it may come as no surprise that this strategy is in fact driven by a system. Ooh, I love systems. So contrary to the belief that creativity is always a spontaneous thing, which it is sometimes, but more often, my team and I have found that having a structured approach to creativity actually fuels more of it, and it just creates better content. So to increase creativity and to remove roadblocks from our process, we actually use five primary types of content, and these types of content, they drive value in my business. So they are one free nurture content. So nurture content could be this podcast, because it's nurturing an audience that I already have. 
But the second type of content is free attractor content. And that's the kind of content that brings people in. This podcast does that as well. So that's number one, why I love podcasting so much. It nurtures the audience I already have, and it attracts a new audience when they find me through search or through a recommendation from a friend. Another example of free attractor content would be lead magnets that you can download for free. So we've got nurture content and attractor content. Nurture content could also be a newsletter. So if you do a newsletter, people sign up for the newsletter and every week you're delivering them a new newsletter, that would be nurture content. And again, it's free, which is important. So you've got nurture content and attractor content, and then you've got paid course content. So that's obviously my Digital Course Academy program or List Builder Society or my membership Momentum, all paid course content. Then you have paid nurture content. This is the content that we create for engagement platforms like my private Facebook groups or maybe some live workshops or live events I do with my students. So if you are one of my students and you come to a live event and we are asking questions in the comments and we are encouraging you to get into the comments, we've created content to nurture that experience. Or if you buy Digital Course Academy and you get 10 weeks with me in a private Facebook group, well, my team has created paid nurture content. You paid to be in the group. And this content is to encourage engagement and make sure we take care of you. So we actually create content around that. I don't think that one's talked about enough, paid nurture content. And then finally, paid bonus content. So these are the extra materials that enhance the value of my courses and support students who enroll. So if you ever are in my program, Digital Course Academy, you know I talk a lot about creating bonuses to enhance your offer. Well, those bonuses are content and you gotta create it. So that would be the fifth type of content we create. So this clarity and content type provides us with a framework and a structure whenever we're starting to produce a new asset. But inside this structure, my team and I know we have ample freedom to innovate and stay creative. So it's a structure, but once you get inside, you have a lot of creativity in the way you create the content. But by clearly understanding the content they're tasked with, my content team knows exactly what they are creating and why. Knowing the end goal of each piece of content, whether it's nurturing or delivering a paid product, et cetera, spares them from the drain of constant small decisions, freeing their minds for greater creative expression and innovation. But what about those moments when they're still hit with a creative block and they find themselves staring at a blank computer screen? We've all felt writer's block, right? It's not fun. So here's a tip from my senior content manager, Jill, for dealing with this type of block. She says, step into your ideal customer avatar's shoes. So when Jill comes to a roadblock, she asks herself, where is this person now and what do they really need to learn and really need to understand from this content I'm creating to advance in their journey? I'm going to read that one more time. So where is this person now? So where are they in this moment? And what do they really need to learn or to understand from the content I'm creating to help them move forward in their journey? So Jill knows that in order to help our audience progress, we must meet them where they are and help them feel seen and understood. Then we can build a bridge with our content that guides them with small steps, producing real results toward their goal. So if you're struggling to meet your audience where they are, It might be beneficial to engage in an imagination conversation with your ideal customer avatar, your ICA. I know it might seem a bit unusual, but try this mental exercise. I want you to envision your ideal customer avatar in your mind, and I want you to have a conversation with them and ask them, where are you right now in your journey? And what do you really need to know to keep going or to get unstuck or to get those results? What do you need to know? What do you need to understand? Then I want you to stay with me. I want you to respond to yourself, drawing on everything you understand about their persona and how they might answer that question. You're just giving an educated guess, just based on what you know, how might they answer that question? I think this mental role play 
can be a powerful tool in understanding and addressing the diverse needs of your audience. So many times we assume our ideal customer knows something, whether it be a vocabulary term specific to your industry or where to find a certain tool that you're talking about because we know this content really well. So what happens is oftentimes we create content that is too advanced and it risks losing people or stalling their progress because we're literally speaking over their head. I learned this lesson early on. I think in the beginning, I was creating content for my peers. I would create content thinking about my friends in the industry and people that might be my competitors. I was really weird. I was creating content for my peers. And then I realized, wait a second, that is not who I'm serving. They might be looking at what I'm doing, but I'm creating content for someone who literally is starting from scratch. They have no idea what they're doing and I'm there to make them feel supported. I've got to take like five steps back. So a lot of the times when you do these exercises, you realize, wait a second, I am creating content for someone who is five steps ahead of those that I actually serve. I need to pull it back a bit. And I think in that instance, it helps so much in terms of clarity. So you need to look at what you're delivering to your ICA through their eyes. This empathetic approach can make your content more relatable and heartfelt. This is also the main reason we spend a lot of time doing research about our ICA. If you've yet to develop an ICA, again, your ideal customer avatar in your business, after today's episode, I want you to go listen to episode 235. It's an oldie but a goodie and totally still stands to this day. I created it a few years ago but it's called How to Identify Your Ideal Customer Avatar and make it a priority to develop a really clear understanding of this person. Listen, it's not the sexy stuff. A lot of my students don't love working on their ICA because they wanna be creating the content and doing the webinars and, and creating the funnels and all of that. But if you really don't get to the heart of who you are serving, it all feels tough, it's hard. If you're struggling in this area, I'm going to link to it in the show notes, but it's episode 235. I think this will help you have these rich conversations in your head that will then develop some really great content. Another key strategy for conquering creative blocks comes from my niece, Ava, who is actually a content coordinator on my team. She has a straightforward technique that can quickly reignite inspiration and get you unstuck when creating content. Simply start writing. And once you start, don't stop, even when you feel your flow isn't there. So Ava often employs placeholder text when this happens, such as, here, I'll talk about my morning routine, to keep her thoughts flowing when she hits a snag. It's all about breaking through that initial barrier and gaining momentum. So she might not know what to say about the morning routine just yet, but she's like, this is where I'm going to talk about it. And she just keeps typing. Remember, the first draft of your content is just that. It's a draft. It can be a poopy, I won't say the bad word, a poopy draft, but it's just a draft. It's meant to be edited and refined later. So the key is to keep the ideas moving. Ava shared a quote from Jody Picoult, and it's one that she's used for years and is instrumental in her approach to creating. And the quote is, you can always edit a bad page but you can't edit a blank page. I think this mindset is such a powerful tool for content creators. And it's a reminder that perfection isn't the goal in the initial stages. Your first draft is meant to be messy. The important thing is to start and put something down and you could build from there. And as you edit your content, my team always reads the final draft out loud before considering it done. Now, this might sound simple, but you'd be amazed at how transformative it can be when you're actually reading it out loud. You catch things that you normally wouldn't catch. So when you read your words, it's like holding a mirror up to them. You'll catch phrases that sound awkward or stumble over sentences that are too complex and notice areas where the flow just doesn't feel right. 
So this practice brings you closer to your audience's experience. And when you read it out loud, it allows you to see if you're looking for like something casual, but also making an impact and conversational, you'll figure that out when you're reading it aloud. So just something to think about. Now, I know we covered quite a bit with this first strategy, but I hope it's showing you how blending various approaches, like sticking to a structured content method, adopting your audience's perspective, and breaking through initial writing blocks can inspire your creativity and keep your content fresh. All right, let's move on to the next key strategy, implementing organizational and management systems for peak efficiency. That's kind of a mouthful and a little bit sounding like corporate, which I hate, but just stay with me here because I'll break it down. This one is all about streamlining your workflow to ensure everything runs like a well-oiled machine. And to do this, we rely on our project management tool, Asana, so A-S-A-N-A, -A -A, Asana, to keep track of both our major and minor projects. Any type of content or project my team and I are working on has a corresponding task in Asana. So within each main task for that piece of content we're creating, let's say we're creating a lead magnet. So within that main task of creating a lead magnet, we use subtasks to break down specifics such as research, copy needs, design needs, uploading, quality control, and so on. So this approach keeps everything organized and in one place, complete with deadlines. And it's like lining up all your little ducks in a row, ensuring that every step in the content creation process from ideation to execution is accounted for and nothing slips through the tracks. So building on that, we have a crystal clear system for storing our content as well. So every piece of content we create is filed in a specific Google Drive folder categorized by year, program, and content type. I keep all of my content that's copy related in Google Drive folders. Again, we organize by the year it was created, the program it was created for, and the type of content, let's say a lead magnet or a webinar or a video script. That's what I mean by type of content. Any digital assets like video or graphics, they're stored in Dropbox. This just works for us. So if it's a video asset, a graphic stored in Dropbox. So my Google Drive and my Dropbox folders, we use the same system for naming so that they mirror each other. This makes it super easy to file and find things. Like if you asked me, Amy, can you go find a webinar deck from 2020 that you used for the DCA launch. I literally will be able to find it in two seconds. Like that's how quick it is because of how we name our files and structure our files and the whole team knows how to do it. It's a big deal. I know it sounds, again, not so sexy, but to me, it's super sexy. I love organizing in that way, but it's something that saves us a lot of time, especially as you start to grow your team. I've got 20 full-time employees that are looking for stuff online on Google Drive and Dropbox. Can you imagine if... Every five minutes, I had to stop and help someone find something from years ago because they're brand new. That would totally slow us down, right? It doesn't happen. So this system really works. And listen, I understand that in the early seasons of running your business, especially if you're a one-person team, taking a moment to slow down and focus on organizational tasks can seem like it should take a backseat to things that are really important, like serving your students and making money. And I am absolutely guilty of not having a system in my first few years of business, but I highly regret it. It took us a long time to clean everything up. So imagine if you just started this now, you won't have to have years and years of cleanup. And here's the thing, I promise you, setting aside just a couple of hours to get hyper-organized with your content assets, it will pay off massively in the long run. It's about investing a little time now to save a lot of time later. It's an approach that not only enhances efficiency, but it also brings a sense of calm and control to your content creation process. All right, let's move on to strategy number three, mastering content repurposing. Now we've all heard the saying, don't reinvent the wheel. And nowhere is this more relevant than in content creation. In today's information-saturated world, repeating your message is vital to stand out. 
And so if you're repurposing your content and people are hearing your message in different ways and on different platforms, that's a good thing. I learned from my good friend, Stu McLaren, that if you feel like you are repeating yourself over and over again, when you are delivering your content, that is a good thing because you have found your niche, you understand your most important message that you want to get out, and you're talking about it in all these different ways. But at the end of the day, it's the same content that you repurpose. That is a good thing, because people need to hear it over and over again before they take action. So I am a big fan of repurposing. So let's break down how my team effectively repurposes content and how you can use the same system in your business. So let's use an example of repurposing a podcast episode. So after I record a podcast episode, my team gets a downloaded transcript of the episode. Then inside of a Google Doc, they pull the main content points out. So for this episode, they would pull out the five strategies for creating content. They also select standout quotes and stories that I tell and use those as bullet points and create a summary paragraph. So pulling out the main points, pulling out the quotes, pulling out some of the stories, that's all for the show notes for this podcast episode. So they just use the content to make the show notes. And then they can take, let's say some of the quotes from this episode and create a graphic using Canva to post in, let's say some of my paid course communities or on social media. So repurposing the content in this way ensures that we have a consistent message all across platforms, but we're also engaging in our other areas of business. So remember how I talked about paid nurture content? So it's the content that we develop for our communities. Well, we take some of that content for our paid communities out of the podcast. And so we repurpose it and use it to engage in conversations inside of our communities. So these are just a few ways where we take the podcast content, use it on social, use it in our paid communities, and use it for our show notes so that we are never looking at a blank Google Doc figuring out what kind of content to create in these different areas. To understand more about this strategy, I recommend listening to episode 282 of my podcast, which is called 10 Ways to Repurpose One Single Piece of Content. I'll link to it in the show notes for easy access. Now, this brings us to our fourth strategy for today's episode, integrating AI tools into your content process. So even though my team and I have established this system for content repurposing that I just talked about, I think AI tools like ChatGPT, they bring an added layer of efficiency and innovation. So for instance, take the podcast repurposing example that we just discussed. Rather than my team needing to spend time pulling quotes or themes from the podcast, we can now feed the transcript into ChatGPT with a prompt that asks the tool to do the following, quote, extract five key teaching points and strategies from this episode that I can use in a lead magnet. Now, this strategy not only saves time, but also keeps our content aligned and focused. It's about staying true to our core message and our core themes while leveraging AI to streamline and enrich our content creation process. I know that my social media manager also has taken podcast transcripts, put them into chat GPT and said, pull out five quotes that will inspire and ignite action for my students, something like that. And that's how she gets the quotes that I often post on social media. So if you follow me on Instagram, I often will post quotes that are mine and they get taken out of transcripts from podcast episodes. So that makes it really easy as well. Also, it's no secret that AI and tools like ChatGPT, they've started to fundamentally change how we approach our work. So while I was chatting with my content team about ChatGPT, we kept coming back to the concept how we can use it best. And it really should act, in my opinion, like an assistant or intern for our content creation needs. So whether we need help with condensing, rephrasing, pulling out quotes, like I mentioned, ChatGPT has consistently proven its value. It's incredible at organizing thoughts into coherent outlines or refining text. Now, what I don't like to use it for is to create my content. ChatGPT, how it is today, will not be creating content from scratch for me. 
I think it would be very obvious to you if I did that. And so again, I like to use it as an intern or an assistant and more so organizing the content versus creating it from scratch. So I want to give you a glimpse into another way we use ChatGPT when we're creating content. We'll ask ChatGPT to generate 20 different title options for a piece of content that we've already created. Now, we don't just take these suggestions as they are. They're more like springboards, again, an assistant to get us started, and then we make them great. I think the real magic happens when we mix and match elements from these suggestions to craft the perfect final title for a podcast. So it's like a brainstorming session, but with an AI partner. We sift through the options and then we take the best parts and we just sharpen the message. But here's a key point my team lives by. Never simply take its final output as your final draft. Engage with ChatGPT as though it were a colleague and creative collaborator. Bounce ideas off of it, use it for feedback, and integrate it into your brainstorming. But AI is merely a tool to help with content creation, never something to replace you or your ideas. And I do want to back up and say, also, if you're staring at a blank Google Doc and you want to get started, you can use ChatGPT to get you started. So in that sense, I guess you could say it's creating the content, but never, ever let it be your end all be all. I promise you, you will get lost in the mix of the online noise if you're only using content generated from ChatGPT. It will never be unique enough to stand out, but it is a great thing to get you started or just to get those creative juices flowing if you feed it something and then it gives you something back that you can use. So I like to use it both ways. I usually like to use it. I've already created something. Now I'm asking ChatGPT to do something with it to take my content further. So there you have it. Okay, and with that, we made it to our fifth and final strategy in today's episode, cultivating a strategic content creation mindset. So this strategy is all about how my team and I infuse each piece of content with intention and purpose. So whenever my team and I are crafting a new piece of content, let's take like a lead magnet for my podcast as an example. We start by asking key questions like, what's the intention behind the content? Is the additional information we're providing actually moving the topic forward? Will this tool genuinely aid my students' learning or will it just take up more of their time? Ooh, that last one is important. I want to say it one more time. Will this piece of content, this lead magnet, this tool, whatever you're creating, will it genuinely aid my students' learning or will it just take up more of their time? So these questions help us ensure we're always mindful of our end goal and how each piece of content fits into the larger picture of our students' journey. So it drives us to ask, Are we truly adding value? Are we making a real difference? Remember, every piece of content is a piece in the bridge that connects you to your audience. It's about building that bridge with care and intention and a deep understanding of the needs and the aspirations of those that you serve. I think this is the essence of a strategic creation mindset that transforms content from just mere information into a powerful tool for connection and changing lives. Okay, we just covered a lot, I know. But as we wrap up today's episode, it's your turn to put these strategies that my content team and I use into action. Start small if you need to. Maybe pick one strategy that resonates most with you and then implement it this week. You could take a piece of content that you've been kind of stuck working on and look at it through the lens of your ideal customer avatar and ask, how can you meet them where they are right now and then create a bridge to where they want to go. Or maybe you can add more systems to your process by setting aside two hours to organize your digital workspace this week. To me, that's my most favorite option. Just take the time to set up or refine your project management system. You don't need to use Asana. You can use Monday, you can use Basecamp, whatever you use, but just get a project management tool and take some time to set it up And then also set up your Dropbox or your Google Drive in terms of the different folders you're creating so that you could find things quickly and the team that you're creating can find things quickly as well. 
Now, if you have a lot of content that you need to create right now, maybe try selecting a piece of your existing content and repurposing it. And you can maybe find five new pieces of content to do that with. Also, you could experiment with AI, maybe take a transcript of something you've already created and ask AI to pull out some of the best pieces and use that elsewhere. And then also just reflect on each piece of content with intention and purpose. Ask yourself critical questions about the value and impact it has on your audience. Ensure that every piece of content aligns with your goals and truly serves and also doesn't overwhelm or just take up more of the precious time of your students and your community. Make sure it absolutely adds value and has a purpose. As you start to use these five strategies more, remember to experiment, observe the results, and just adjust them to make sure that they're fitting your goals. It's not about perfection. It's just about progress. And remember this, each step you take is a learning opportunity that brings you closer to mastering the art of online content creation. Thank you so much for following along, and I can't wait to see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye for now. 